um, corporate vice president for uh, Power Automate at Microsoft. So, you know, they say the Power Platform is um, the undisputable leader in the low code, no code. Steve plays a big role in making this happen. So if you guys use it on a day to day basis and you think this is awesome, you need to thank this guy. But Sorry. now he's going to address us and he's going to tell us all about the goodness of the platform and his vision and how he makes that happen. So over to you, Steve. Uh, you're on mute now. OK. Uh, is my screen coming through? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So just to confirm, you can both hear me and see the screen, yes? Yep. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so thanks. Thanks so much for for listening today. Um, so I'm just going to spend you know the next 15 minutes or so uh, talking a little bit about you know why I'm so passionate about the Power Platform, why I think this is an area that that is super exciting uh, that we will be uh, you know really investing in as Microsoft in the in the coming years. So I'm going to start with this quote from Satya, who said that. You know, Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, and the Power Platform are top of what we're doing with Azure and at the core of what we're doing as a company. And, you know, we often as Microsoft, we think about the Microsoft Cloud strategy and the Power Platform is really, you know, the key of, of a lot of those things. Um, so this is a, a super exciting area. And, you know, I'll spend a couple minutes just explaining why we think the Power Platform is so important. You know, one reason is because uh, the over the next five years, there will be more applications created than have been created in the last 40 years. So there's really uh, a massive opportunity that's out there. Um, and from an automation perspective, you know, this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about. There will be half of all digital activities, work activities out there, have some potential for automation already. So, so this is a, a massive opportunity that is there to help people uh, you know, transform the way that they work, the way that they're getting stuff done. Now, that being said, though, there's a big challenge, which is there aren't enough professional developers out there to actually solve all of these challenges. You know, there's a 1 million developer shortfall. 86% of companies are struggling to hire sufficiently technical talent to solve the need of all of these applications, of all of these automations that are out there that want to be built. Um, so huge mismatch between supply and demand. And then on top of that, you have to layer in kind of the, the macroeconomic situations, you know, COVID, uh, great reshuffle, you know, is there a global recession coming? Who knows? Um, but these things together have led people, A, you know, the labor market is still tight enough that people are looking for jobs where they feel they can be productive, where they feel they can, you know, not be wasting time with old systems, with legacy systems, they can instead spend, instead spend time on doing exciting things, on new things where they can really be productive. Um, and from an economic perspective, you know, if we are entering into a, a global recession period, organizations are going to need to find ways to reduce the cost of their existing infrastructure. They're gonna need to find ways to be more efficient to be more effective with the resources that they do have. So all of these things together have led us to realize that we can't simply teach everybody in the world to code. That would be too expensive, it's impossible, uh, it would take far too long. But what we can do is we can turn everybody into, developer, into a developer by using low code capabilities. Um, and that is the, the vision for empowering everyone with low code. Now that being said, just because we think that those citizen developers, the business users, can now start building out automation, can build applications. That doesn't mean that those are the only people who can get advantages from low code. In fact, we see in the Power Platform today a ton of people who are IT admins, who are professional developers. And what they're doing is they're using the Power Platform because it is so much faster 
and so much easier to get started with the Power Platform than it would be to open up Visual Studio, to start a new project, to, you know, to write .NET functions. Although, to be honest, with technologies like GitHub Copilot, we are making a lot of those things a lot easier. It still is faster and easier to use low code for a lot of the challenges that developers, that everybody are facing every single day. So uh, that's you know really the the big picture. But there's you know a number of additional stats that I'd I'd love to share with you. And you know the the spending, the investment in low code is just astronomical. So from an organization perspective, you know now is a great time to think about how you can you know it really enhance your investment get onto this bandwagon because it's taking off at an, uh, at an astronomical rate. You're, you know, um, so from an automation perspective as well, uh, you know, by some estimates, even by next year, over almost two thirds of organizations that are deploying automation technologies are going to be introducing AI into their automation. And this is something when we think about the power platform, we've you know talked a lot about in the past, but just recently, with the announcements at Ignite, we have really jumped in with both feet to bring AI into the process of building out applications, into the process of building app uh, applications and automation. So, you know, a couple examples of that, you know, you may have seen at Ignite, you can now, for example, speak a sentence, use natural language, describe the automation that you want to be built, and we can generate for you a power automate flow based on that sentence that you speak out loud. And for in terms of building applications, you can literally take a picture of a hand-drawn form or you know, write on the whiteboard, you know, just sketch out an application. And when you do that, you can take a snapshot of that and Power Apps will use AI to understand what all those elements are. And not only can it generate a form for you, but it can also generate a data backend in Dataverse that has the right appropriate fields and, and data that, that, that backs that form. So you have a fully functioning application with inferred data schema by just sketching it on a whiteboard. So these are things that are available today. Uh, and this is the type of thing that we will be doing, you know, in this year and next year and the coming years uh, to introduce AI. And as we go a little further out, this democratization that we're seeing is going to drive the lines of business to be making decisions about how they can use low code. So the software buying decisions, we're seeing that you know, in the next couple of years, most of that will happen outside of central IT. Instead of it being central IT top down, everybody must follow one methodology, one way of doing things. All of the adoption of these low code platforms will enable each individual department to be successful. So uh, there's lots and lots of things that are happening here. And you know, if we look at 2026, for example, by some estimates, uh, you know, 80% of uh, the uh, application development outside of central IT will be low code, up from 60% last year. Um, so it's really, really growing uh, to this, this massive level. And we think that, frankly, this will be accelerated by those trends that I was just talking about by the you know, economic conditions, the need to focus on doing less or doing more with less resources, the need to focus on that half of digital work that can be automated. And ultimately, uh, this is something that we as Microsoft have been recognized as a leader in. Uh, with Power Apps, for example, we are a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant in the low-code application platform. With Power Automate, we are a leader in the RPA and the robotic process automation quadrant as well. And half of CIOs would select Microsoft as their automation platform. And you know, an, another interesting stat I like to share is we today have over 7 million people who are using Power Automate. And think, com compared to the, the total pot user base of any other automation platform out there, you know, this certainly dwarfs that. It's the number one adopted low code platform in the world the power platform is and you know this is something that you know drives very clear roi for businesses 
it, this again dovetails back to that point of with these economic situations, we need to find ways to be more efficient to increase overall efficiency. And you know, this is a specific example for Power Automate. We've done the same thing for Power Apps as well. Um, but the ROI over three years, and this is Forrester did this study, can be basically three x. Right, 3x ROI in three years, um, saving millions of dollars uh, after applying, you know, the improvement from productivity. And the other thing that's really, really important, beyond the amount of time productivity this can save, by moving to a low-code platform where you can formalize these processes, where you can move away from Excel and email as the place where these processes live, where you know, I'm this this uh, week. I'm in Washington D.C. I've been meeting with a lot of the government organizations here uh, in in the in this, the capital, and you know, a lot of them are still using paper processes. But even if they're not using paper processes, you know, what they've done is they've you know moved that process to digital by putting in an email. And and yes, that that email it's certainly better than you know physical pen and paper. Although there's still a lot of that that happens. Um, but that's still not really digitally transformed. That hasn't been transformed the way that the business works by really making that process use a strong data store, by making sure that the security is tracked and that you have clear audit history. All of those things are possible with the Power Platform, and thus you can reduce the errors, reduce things that are dropped, and instead focus on improving resiliency and reliability. Um, and this is something you know that that Coca-Cola has done, for example. Um, so you know I don't think the audio is coming through, which is fine. Um, but what Coca-Cola has done is they have looked at how they can transform some of their processes, and in doing so, uh, they have saved uh, a massive amount of money by going from a manual legacy process for tracking shipments to a fully automated process. And it's not just Coca-Cola, it's actually organizations across every industry, across every size. Um, so 97% of the Fortune 500 is using the power platform. And this is healthcare, public sector, consumer goods, wherever you are, uh, you can actually leverage the power platform to be successful. And the, you know, the, the final note that I, I would like to, to leave you on is a little bit of where we're going with this platform. And it's beyond just you know, thinking of these individual siloed applications. So you know, with the Power Platform, we have Power Apps, Power Automate, Power BI, Power Pages, Power Virtual Agents. All of those work together. You know, from a Power Automate perspective, it's not automation as just an island, one little piece off in its own silo. Instead, we offer a holistic platform with the, the Power Platform, where you need AI, you need BI, you need low code, you need chatbots, all of those interact, right? I can create a dashboard that sends off an alert that kicks off an automation inside of Power Automate. And even within Power Automate, we offer a variety of different technologies, right? We have RPA for automating on the desktop. We have DPA, which is digital process automation, but that's really about the, the cloud automation that uses our hundreds of different connectors um, that you can use for, um, for processing things. And we have new capabilities coming to the platform, like process mining. Um, so earlier this year, we acquired a company called Mineit, uh, which is all about process mining. And that helps you to understand the end to end of your process across your organization by looking at all of the data you have in your various logs and your various systems, pulling that information in and making recommendations on how you can use Power Apps, Power Automate, the different parts of the platform to really solve these core business needs. So with that, uh, you know, I'd love to just say uh, thank you for listening. I know that all of the great things that are happening in the community today are really what makes the, the platform so successful. Right, it's from the feedback that we get from all of you at this uh, the session that we can know what it is that it's important, what it is that we need to work on next. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for for all of your contributions, all of your feedback, everything you do to make the platform be successful. Because our goal ultimately is to take all of these capabilities and make them available to you uh, to make you uh, successful. So, thank yeah. you, thank you very much for that, uh, Steve. Um, it, you, you, you hit it right there um, with, with your message because everything you were saying 
definitely resonates with the New Zealand the, New Zealand, and, um, the people joining us from around the world as well in terms of um, popularity of the platform uh, and the amount of people that are available out there to deliver. Um, so um, you, you talked about a lot of new technologies. Just um, one quick question. Um, the purpose of this conference is to get people upskilled to understand the capabilities that are available out there, but you guys are delivering at such a high accelerated rate that we cannot cope with it. <laughs> what is your advice on how to keep on top of it? Yeah, so the one thing I would say is we have a ton of great content in the community for learning about new technologies. So there are MVPs out there, for example, who are creating YouTube videos. I love watching the YouTube channels. Um, you know, the second that we release a new feature, uh, there's going to be new YouTube videos out there that describe how to use the latest things. And you know, if you if your video isn't your thing, that's fine, right? There's blogs. Uh, we have Microsoft Learn, which covers we have modules that are always created that reflect the, the latest things that are happening. So you can always go online, look at our content, and that will be kept up to date with the latest technology. So it doesn't matter if you're new to the platform today or you've been working with it for five years, you can always check out the latest on our, on our content sites, on our blog sites, in the forums, and, uh, and get caught up right away. Awesome. Thank you for that. Rich, Hamish, any uh, final words for Steve before uh, we let him join his uh, plane? No, I'm all good. Thank it's you, Steve. Audience. That's great, great presentation. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, thanks, I hope David. you all have a, a wonderful rest of uh, your summit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Cheers. Bye -bye. Wow, that was a, a great uh, message coming from Steve. Um, so what we're going to do next is um, just uh, quickly start with the local keynote. So um, I'll take the stage, as I am right now, and then I'll uh, hand over to Hamish and Rich that are joining us from uh, Oakland and Christchurch. Um, so as I said before, this is um, the most successful hybrid event that we've had to date. Um, we've got great attendance in person here in Wellington. Um, we're um, going to get the same feedback from Hamish and from um, uh, Rich down in, in Christchurch. Uh, but what Steve was saying, he actually stole my thunder. I actually wanted to say something very similar to what he's saying. Um, I, I was just reading an article a couple of days ago around how the economy is doing. And I was actually really impressed to learn that the unemployment rate has been the lowest in New Zealand since 1989. Um, I was in nappies back then. Um, you know, to me, this is something completely foreign. Um, and uh, we, we're around the four percent of unemployment. The other interesting stat that I read about is that uh, people they, they surveyed people to see how comfortable they are that they have job stability. And by job stability, they mean um, you know, do they have a fear that they're going to be made redundant or um, be dismissed, or do they see longevity in their careers? And that number has changed from 40% to 60% today in terms of people feeling comfortable. And a lot of it is attributed, apparently, to people finding permanent positions as opposed to contracting positions. So this is all interesting and it's all positive to see that people are busy and, and you know people are, are doing great things. But then correlate that to the shortage that we have in the market. Um, so as, as we say, I'm, I'm actually originally from, from the Middle East. Um, and over there, we hear a lot about those really rich countries like um, um, you know, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. Um, so in Dubai specifically, in, um, in, in Abu Dhabi, for example, they say that those cities are suffering from their own success. They require a lot of talent to come into those um, countries. Um, and they do attract a lot of people. And the best way to attract talent is to give them high salaries. So people have high expectations about how much they're going to earn over there. So a lot of people immigrate there. But then you need the infrastructure to support that. You need the um, housing to support that, the schooling. So as a consequence, all of that becomes very expensive. And that's why they say those areas suffer from their own success, because you go there, you earn a lot, but at the same time, you spend a lot to be able to, to, to survive over there. And in a way, we're seeing that with the Power Platform. So the Power Platform is going at a phenomenal rate in terms of all the features that it's delivering, in terms of being the leader in, in the quadrant, and then thinking about how um, all CIOs are now like, I want Power Automate, I want Power Apps, I want to build this, I want to build that. But the problem is that there are no people to go and deliver that. 
Um, so there is a, um, a common phenomenon that we, we, we call it like the uh, great resignation effect, if you want. Uh, we've got different names for it. But basically, the, the idea behind it is that what people, is, uh, what people are doing is jumping from one position to another to go and get higher salary because there is that fight in the market on resources. And once you go to another organization and they give you a higher salary then that comes with an expectation that if you're going to be earning that much, that means that you need to be delivering that much and you need to have that sort of knowledge. So it's almost guaranteed that we in this room are going to get a pay rise at some stage or we're going to go somewhere else and then get a higher salary. But what's not guaranteed is whether we're going to be up to the level of um, you know, justifying that jump in, in salary. The good news is that you guys have made the right choice to come and attend this conference. <laughs> and as such, you're going to go and justify to your hiring manager to say, I've learned this and this and this, I can do this and that because I've attended those conferences. And as Steve said, you know, we've got some material um, that is available all around the, the internet. He mentioned actually YouTube videos. Um, we know Eliza uh, Benitez, who's actually Wellington-based, who's one of the diva champions in terms of the Power Automate um, YouTube channel. Um, she just lives here in Wellington. So follow her, have a look at her blog. Um, across the ditch, we've got um, Lisa Crosby, who also has great content and all the new features that come out um, on, on a sort of weekly basis. So her, her content is also really good. And of course, I don't want to um, sort of dismiss all the other people around the world, but those are the ones that are closer to us that uh, you might be interested in. Um, so we've got a lot of content during the day. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of different aspects from a technical perspective, from a, a functional perspective, but also we've got a balance of um, sort of not, not technical at all sessions. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to get someone from uh, MBIE and DIA to talk about their experience, and they're not technical people, their experience on how they deliver large um, Dynamics 365 projects and so on. And also, we've got some sessions dedicated to governance, to looking after your platform, watering it, and being it, best practices, and so on. So I'm really happy to see you guys here um, online as well. Um, and hopefully, we can hear from the rest of our um, co-hosts. So we've got um, uh, Richard Burns, um, who is in Christchurch. Um, he's leading that leg. We also have uh, Hamish Shield up in Auckland, looking after the Auckland crowd. And we've got two online sessions. The two online streams are actually uh, dedicated for international speakers. Um, and those are led by um, uh, Jiva, as well as Eric Tenier, um, sort of across the world. And then maybe later Lynn will, will, will take over one of those streams. Uh, but without further ado, Hamish, do you want to um, give us a, a quick spiel? How are you doing? Sure. Can you hear me, Rami? Yes, I can. Uh, awesome. Well, we've had a lot of tech issues this morning. So Sorry to the people here in Auckland, I didn't get to have a chat before we started. We were literally down for the last couple of minutes trying to get this audio sorted. Um, yeah, really great to see Stephen speak. And I think um, you can just see uh, how much Microsoft you know, is supporting us and putting into this event by you know, giving us the guy who heads up the Power Automate uh, platform to have it um, to speak to us. And then also um, Microsoft Auckland New Zealand here have been really good in setting up the room for today. Um, they've made it such a smooth pro. I mean, apart from the tech issues we've had, it's been a really smooth process, right? They've sorted out the food and the drinks and everything that everyone's got here. So um, do shout out to the Microsoft guys when you see them walking around the building today. Um, just on the topic of, you know, I guess the, the reason why we're here is to upskill it and learn. And we've, when we've talked about how um, you know, the, the platform you know, dynamics and the power platform are just changing at this massive rate at the moment. It's very hard to keep up. Um, obviously, this is one of the things we try to do to um, keep people informed and up to date. My I guess my top tips around that is um, I use a tool called Feedly, which is basically you can um, take all of your blog, the blogs that you follow, take all your favorite links and put them into this app, and it will just give you a feed of all of your blogs combined together. Um, and so I usually have a bit of a daily scan of that, see anything I like, and I can dive it into and to read something more. Um, that's one of my tips. The other one is, um, as Rami said, the MVPs and Stephen said as well, the MVPs with a lot of content. Um, and so one of my favorite things to do is just to follow MVPs on your favorite you know, social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter. And yeah, literally as things get announced, they're, they're announcing things as well. So it's a really good way. I, you know, I just scroll through my feed and you get a bit of an update 
within a, a few minutes of what's being released over that over that day because we know it's just it's a constant stream of new things all of the time so i'll keep it short and sweet uh, i just wanted to yeah give a few tips about yeah how we do keep up to date but thank you everyone for coming today it's good to see a good turnout here in auckland um we haven't been together in a while it's been a lot of online and hybrid events over the last few years so great to see everyone in person and looking forward to catching up with a few breaks <laughs> All right, thanks, Rami. Awesome. Rich, over to you. Yeah, mate. Cool. I've got people behind me. There are actually people in the room. And um, did you guys get swag from Microsoft as well to give out? Or is it just Christchurch giving it out? Like that stuff. Dynamics t shirts. You get those? <laughs> well, I should have come to Christchurch and they got a t shirt to give out. <laughs> Um, so we've got the food sorted as well. From, thank, thank you very much, Microsoft, for sorting us out. Uh, so we've got some little bags, some um, little booklets and some T-shirts. So every presenter is going to be able to give something away today. So good job coming down. That's the, the bad side about being online for sessions. So come in, you can do it. Um, in terms of what Steve was saying, like and trying to keep up with what's going on, I find so similar to Hamish, follow the people that you know, um, but also um, just focus on what you you want to focus on right because there's so many things that you can do and you can't be across everything so if you're good at power automate then stay in there right and learn about that and just be aware of what happens around you because and then just know how to um if you get a situation where you need to learn something know who to tap into to find out an answer right so this room is all about people in the community all coming in and talking so there's a mix of consultants and makers um and decision makers hopefully out there um so the idea is within christchurch is just to share knowledge right so together we're better right so when i was learning sharepoint a long long time ago it was all um, sharing is caring and so um i learned from other people in the community and that made me better right so then hopefully giving back so that's the whole reason why we're here so i hope that's going to work and we've got great sessions today reflective of what happens in christchurch we've got a bit of dynamics lots of power automate lots of power apps and lots of governance today for our sessions so um but if anyone has any questions just put them in the chat um we are recording all the sessions as well for everyone so at the end of this they'll be in stream i guess something um for everyone can, can catch up and read uh, or watch um but yeah any questions just just ask and catch up with us during the breaks um connect with all the speakers because they're happy to share as well um that's it i'll shut up and let rami go back sounds good richard thanks thanks for that um do we have michelle um on the call has she joined us I'll message you. I think she was coming at about five past, so I know you like to keep going, Rami. So you just you just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of ideas. So so um, roughly, how many people do we have? Um, you guys can see um, the Wellington office. How many people do we have up in Auckland? Hey, Michelle, on mute. We, yeah, we must have about thirty, I'd say. Okay. So pretty good turnout for about forty-five regist register. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're looking pretty good. I can't get that camera to turn around, unfortunately. That's about the same in, in Wellington. And and how is uh, Christchurch looking? It's a bit blurry, Rich. I don't know. Maybe I'm not wearing my 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 glasses. There's like there's heaps heaps in the room. We've got about three, I think. Off the top of my head, which is massive for Christchurch. So, what are you talking about? We're actually in a we're in a department store, and they're all mannequins. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all good. Hey, Rami, yeah, Michelle's on, online, queued up, ready to go. All right, okay, so I'll, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, oh, there she is, awesome. Nice to see you, Michelle. Thank you for joining us from all the way from the US. Um, when when I when I first um, sort of met uh, Michelle, which was not too long ago, straight away uh, it hit a string with her story because her story is very, very similar to my story and maybe to a lot of us in, in this room where you know we were kids not too long ago um with you know big aspirations and things that we wanted to do and then you know we work hard and then the next thing you know you are part of a huge community and also you're surrounded by success and you can't believe that you've actually made it it's it's unrealistic and it's very emotional for us to actually be in that situation so when i started um talking to michelle the first thing that came to my mind is we need the hashtag vote for michelle because she's truly awesome and she's going to inspire us with her journey on how she got uh, to microsoft so she is a cloud solution uh, architect a senior cloud solution architect and she's going to tell us about what she does and what are the good things and how she got there over to you michelle 
Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. Not on mute, so that's the first key. I'm going to share my screen. That way you guys are looking at hopefully something a little bit more interesting. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. I am so excited to be here. Happy Friday for y'all. Um, it's Thursday where I am, so I'm almost there. <laughs> Catching up still. So um, yeah, my name is Michelle Sanchez. I am a senior cloud solution architect at Microsoft. And I am a 27-year-old first-generation American, like you said, currently living in the United States. And my job today is really, at, well, my job at Microsoft is really to make sure that our low-code platforms are the best that they can be. And so what I'm going to talk about today, little preface, is my entire career has been changed by Power Platform, so I'm really passionate that technology empowers us to change our companies, our careers, and really our everyday lives. Uh, and fun fact is five years ago, I was actually sitting in the same chairs as many of you are today. Not exactly the same chairs, but I watched uh, Stefan Siciliano give a talk about Power Automate, and now I'm super excited that he was able to kind of talk with you all today. Um, so it's crazy what a few years can do and make a difference. Uh, so I'd like to share my journey into tech and three top lessons that I've learned that kind of helped me accelerate my career, get scouted by Microsoft, and really be where I am today. And when I talk about my journey into tech, I like to include the full spectrum of events that really led me here. Um, I was born as a first-generation American. Both of my parents immigrated uh, to the U.S., my mom from Costa Rica, my dad from Mexico. And for those who are unaware of what it's like to be a first-generation in another country, it's constantly figuring things out on your own. There's not really any resources to figure out how things work in the U.S. or how to get access to things. So really everything you do is a learning process. And it's helping your, nav your family navigate an entirely new country and all of the systems that exist and also trying to figure it out for yourself too. So it's hard. Um, so that's really where I started. A few years pass, my mom, she gets married, unfortunately, not such a nice person. So this leads to growing up with about 10 years of domestic violence in the household. We eventually go bankrupt. Uh, eventually, we decide to kind of escape and uh, move to another state all the way across the country. Um, so a cool 3,000 mile difference there. And then we have a short stint of being homeless. <laughs> And then to top that all off, because I was in high school at the time, um, I graduate high school really by the kindness of a few teachers uh, who decided to be lenient with me, but graduated at the bottom of my class nonetheless. Um, so for me, this is what my rock bottom looks like. Really no prospects of what my career could ever be, uh, that I would even have a career. But at this point is when I decide I need to make a change. And this is kind of the first lesson that I learned in my career very early on, which is when you lack resources, be resourceful. So for me, I was like, all right, here I am, rock bottom, what do I do? So many times we'll find ourselves, and it can be at any stage in our life, for one reason or another, we could be lacking in an area of our lives, whether it's skills, money, time, resources, really anything. And the thing that nobody talks about at rock bottom is that you can really only go up from there. So it's a little bit helpful. Um, it's a difficult place to be, but really there's no other place like it. When you kind of hit, hit that rock bottom and you make the, you make the decision, you say, I'm done with this, I'm making a full, complete change in the direction of my life, and you commit to it, you will fight tooth and nail to get things working. So the first thing I did was make a goal. I said, all right, 
what's my goal? I need to get out of the situation. I need to figure out my life. So I say, I want to work in tech one day. I love tech. I've never really been able to play with it because I was so poor, but I love it nonetheless. Um, and I want to be able to support my entire family. They came to this country to give me opportunities, and I'm going to make that happen. So at this point, because I'm at rock bottom and I make the decision, I'm going into tech. That's it. I'm figuring things out. Um, if you would have asked anybody in my entire life, you said, hey, um, she's going to go into tech. She's going to she has aspirations to work at Microsoft one day. They would have said that is completely delusional. No way. It's not happening. But my favorite thing is I like to say that it's only delusional if it doesn't happen. So it's OK to be a little bit delusional. Um, so so I make this goal. I'm going to go into tech. And then what do I do next? I say, OK, let's take an inventory because we need to make a plan. What things did I have and what things did I lack? I had a delusional belief that I could figure out anything and I could get to where I wanted to go. And I had time to figure that out. I didn't have education or skills or experience. But with this inventory, I made a plan. I said, let's take advantage of the things that I do have in order to get the things that I don't have. So I'm going to get into tech. My plan ends up being I'm going to get a bachelor's degree in computer <laughs> science and I'm going to get hired as a software developer at a tech company right away, of course, as soon as I graduate. And I'm sure everybody in the audience can tell that that's not what happened. Uh, I did not get a bachelor's degree. I got an associate's degree. I got certifications as many as I could get because I had to pay my way through college. And so I said, let's get as much paper as we can while we're here. Uh, my two-year degree took me over three years to get. My major wasn't computer science. It was computer IT. I didn't get hired by a tech company right out of college or as a software developer. In fact, I got hired as an intern for something that I had never heard of, which was SharePoint. <laughs> and so although I had a plan, I wasn't afraid to pivot to meet my overarching goals of getting into tech. Uh, so I so I do the internship. And it's the first time we really get to help people and play with tech and really see how it impacts people's lives. And I love it. And I find Power Platform and I use it for literally everything under the sun. And at this point, I've derailed completely from the plan. I'm doing none of those things. I'm still headed towards my goals because I'm getting those skills and experiences, but it, it's nothing like the plan was. Um, but I'm learning this great technology. I'm getting experience. It's changing the way our company does business. And I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And so I do this for three years and I'm completely happy. And I make a lot of friends, which brings me to my next lesson, which is make genuine connections. So I don't like to call this networking. I don't like the connotations with it. I just like calling it making friends with people. Um, so when you make the decision to be genuine friends with people, something interesting happens is when that relationship exists, you get genuine career advice. People will tell you what you're great at and they will tell you what you're terrible at. And then you can make the decision to change those things and grow in those areas. And a very dear friend of mine told me at this point in my career, he said, you should go into consulting. Uh, you would love it, yada, yada. And I say, okay, I trust your full assessment of my skills and where I lack. And so I go into consulting and I do that for two years. And of course, any consultants in the room can probably tell you it is very challenging and you grow a lot in a short amount of time, but it's super fun and you meet a lot of people who are brilliant. Um, so I just keep making friends with people and I just keep trusting them and trusting their assessment of me and trust that they're gonna challenge me to grow. My first blog and video was because a friend told me, you have to share this knowledge with people. Uh, there might have been a veiled threat in there somewhere. Uh, and my first user group was because a friend asked me to. This is my first keynote. I'm here because a friend asked me to. And I just keep saying yes to things that I wouldn't normally do because I trust that my friends will guide me. And I trust that this community that we have will support me in all of those things. 
And so I keep doing things that I never believed I was capable of and I would never have picked myself to do because I had trusted my friends. It, and it's what put me out there. And ultimately, all of those things that I was doing is what ended up getting me recognized by Microsoft um, and for them to recognize my skill set with Power Platform. So all of this really to say, make friends at work, talk to people at conferences, keep in touch, especially right now in the world that we live in where everything is remote. It's so much easier to meet new people and have those opportunities to list new perspectives, which brings me to my last point, uh, which is unite diverse perspectives. And this third point, you know, it's had glimpses throughout my career and it's been very abundantly clear at Microsoft. So in all of my roles, the most successful projects that have received the most recognition and, you know, contributed to my ability to get promotions and make career changes and contribute to my resume and things like that, um, they've all really had one thing in common. And it's that it wasn't just me. It It's a team effort. It's never been... You know, I find a problem that only I can see and only I know the solution and I come up with the idea, the development, I do all the work. That's not realistic. <laughs> so there's no such thing as a genius to make a genius idea. It's a team effort, really. And I'm sure everybody knows this, but if I were to put a problem up on a slide right now and I showed it to everybody and I asked for the solution, every single person in this room would have a different idea of what would work to fix it. And how, and we could sit here and we could vote and figure out which is the best idea. But I guarantee you that the best idea is still missing something that someone else in this room has thought of. And so even the best ideas need to be challenged and improved to become truly innovative ideas. And those ideas, the ones that have been grown and adapted with the different perspectives, those are the ideas that turn into career changing moments. And so include other people. And it really, the great thing about this is that it all starts with us as people. Um, so the next time you're working on an idea, ask the opinion of someone with a completely different perspective from you. Someone in IT, someone you've never talked to before, um, someone, you know, that you never would have expected to ask them. Uh, I was an intern and people asked me for my ideas all the time and they ended up working. So. It's really cool in that regard. Um, so today, if you happen to meet somebody in a different role, share your latest idea with them and get their opinion and then make the new version of your idea with that feedback included. And I think that's the best part about technology. It's that by working together, we can really go much, much farther. And we all come from different backgrounds and different upbringings and different rock bottoms. And the beautiful thing about that is that it makes everybody have unique perspectives on problems and solution. And so by combining those perspectives, we really come up with the best ideas that are going to change technology for the entire future. And so that really creates the space for innovation. And true innovation that looks like that and feels like that and feels like magic, those are the things that are going to change your career. The entire course of your life can change just by working with other people. So that was my last piece of advice. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some resources on LinkedIn for Power Platform specifically. Um, so if you'd like to see that, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you have a story of you know, how you got into tech and the different phases of your career, feel free to message me on LinkedIn and share those with me because I love to hear them. Uh, thank you to Rich and Hamish and Rami for setting up this amazing summit and have fun at the upcoming sessions. Uh, I look forward to listening to all the recordings and hopefully you guys do too. So have fun today. That was that was beautifully said, Michelle. It's um, very nice, very touching as well. And and again, I, I can totally relate with the things that you're talking about. Um, I love your message about diversity, and that's something that um, you know me growing up, especially earlier in my career, didn't really appreciate. Where I would come in with a tech find and saying, "This is how we're going to resolve it." 
But then, you know, talking to a few non-techies in the room, I realized that there are some things that I didn't take into consideration. And it's not just technical or non-technical, it could also be cultural backgrounds, it could be sort of gender specific and things like that. So it's really, um, I, I really 100% uh, appreciate your message about uh, making sure that we take into consideration all that diversity. One question that I've got for you is um, starting with the power platform or with a specific domain. So quite often, um, as you mentioned, there's lots of information available out there. Some of it is updated, some of it is uh, brand new in preview where uh, you actually don't have access to those uh, capabilities. Um, and sometimes it can get a bit overwhelming to see but where, where should we start? Um, the other aspect of it is how can I start, especially if I don't have the resources and the needs, maybe to get a laptop or um, to uh, you know just get started. Um, do you have any advice on, on how, like your experience in that space? Yeah, so I actually have some personal experience with this because I could not get my hands on a laptop or anything of that sort uh, when I was interested in tech much younger uh, and a little bit naughty, but I would skip school <laughs> and I would go to the library and I would use the computers, public library computers, and I would try to learn everything on there. Luckily for everybody here today, um, there is the Microsoft 365 developer program. Uh, so there's no downloads, no software you need to install. You can access it just on the web and you can start playing with Power Platform there. Everything is completely free. And then on top of that, you have the Microsoft Learn uh, website. It has all of this documentation in a nice kind of compartmentalized short version and you can track your progress on there. Um, they do have certifications and there are ways to get vouchers for those as well. Um, but you don't really need a certification too. It's helpful. It's great if you're trying to go into the business for it. But if you just want to learn right off the bat, experience is the most important thing in tech. Experience speaks volumes to everything. So if you can get an interview and show your stuff, just going on Microsoft Learn and learning all of that content would be extremely beneficial for anybody starting out. That sounds good. And there's never a better time to actually um, go and, and uh, get an interview than now because there is such a big shortage of this yeah. really cool yeah. capabilities that are available out there. And as you said, getting started is, is easy. Like if you've got the will to do it, you will find the means to do it. Love that message. Rich, over to you. Do you have any questions for Michelle? No, so I, I first met Michelle, so you got found in the champions group by Microsoft. So I think you underplayed your skills in the in the power platform because yeah, all, <laughs> all the other good stuff, but also, also really good at what you do too. Um, but are you still working lots with SharePoint with customers or are they all moving into Dataverse? And you probably have to give us a Microsoft answer, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you uh, the Microsoft answer is yes, everyone's going to Dataverse. Uh, the real answer is I'm sure like everybody here is aware, different companies can afford different things. Um, I'm very familiar with that. And different companies are at different points in their you know modernization journey. And it's okay if they're not on Dataverse right away. Um, you know, eventually they might get there, but yeah, I still work with SharePoint at times. I worked with it today. I pulled that out of the vault, it felt like, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> trim some URLs and, and look at uh, list settings and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, companies are all at different points. That's okay. And I always try to make a point like to comfort companies and say, there's no rush. We go there at our own pace. That's all right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Of course. Hamish? Yeah. Um, no real questions, but just yeah, that was amazing, Michelle. Like, thank you so much for sharing your um your journey. Like, we had a call earlier this week, and I didn't quite realize like the gravity of you know of what you've been through. So it's just really inspiring to see where you come from and you know the role you are in now. And um, I didn't also realize your first keynote. So congratulations. That was a um that was amazing and very inspiring and a great way to kick off this event. So thank you for that. Of course. Thank you guys for having me. I love sharing. So all the better. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was an excellent uh, keynote session. And uh, with that, we will close our uh, first session and we'll take a 15-minute uh, break and then come back to uh, the first session of the day at 9.40. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thanks, David. Thanks, Rich.